Bible to the book of Matthew tonight. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, and we'll be looking at verse 33. Just one verse tonight, but this one verse has such a profound teaching in it. It's a huge teaching, the teaching of the leaven. So Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the leaven. Well, the two parables in verses 31 to 33 go together as a pair. Uh, the, the two parables that we looked at uh, before that, the parable of the, uh, of the sower and the soils and the parable of the wheat and the tares, they went together as well. And uh, both uh, the, the parable of the, the sower was the first one. It told us that uh, uh, the seed is the word of God and that it's, it's going to go out the Lord Jesus is, gonna, is going to be the sower, and we're going to be his representatives as well, sowing the good seed. But it's not all going to work out as planned. And not, I don't, not everybody's going to be saved in this world. As much as we would love them to, not everyone's going to be saved. And there's four types of soils that we looked at. Uh, then we looked at the, um, uh, 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 the other uh, parable as part of that pair, the parable of the tares. And we saw that, that uh, the devil goes behind us when we sow the good seed. And he actually sows tares among the wheat. And, uh, you know, we, we, see, we see that when we go out witnessing to people that uh, sometimes the, the devil's been already to those houses and sometimes he comes behind us. But, but there's, uh, there's tares that are sown that look just like the wheat. They're religious people, but they're, there's just an outward form. There's nothing on the inside. The tare is just the outer shell. It lo looks like the wheat, but it's not. Uh, it's not the wheat. And then, last week, uh, again, uh, just like the second parable, Jesus said another parable. The third, for the for the second time, the third the third parable said another parable, and that word another we said means another of the same kind, and so we use the first two parables to interpret the third parable, and so here we get to verse thirty three. Actually, let's read verses thirty one through thirty three because they do go together as a pair. It says in verse thirty one, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and it becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And of course, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, the smallest of things. The Lord Jesus Christ used, used the most humble of things, and it spread, it's, it's supposed to spread, it's supposed to spread rapidly and quickly. Uh, but then, of course, we see that he also told that in the 2,000 years of church history that that mustard seed, that herb, the greatest of herbs, would become something that it was not intended to be, something unnatural, uh, something uh, that was uh, monstrous, this tree with the, the birds of the air, and that which represents the ecumenical movement coming in to the churches and, and corrupting uh, the mustard seed. And so here we see verse 33, which we're looking at tonight, is another parable again, the fourth parable. This is the last parable that is preached in the public in Matthew 13 of the seven parables. It's the last one preached in public. The other three are preached in the house in private to the disciples. Uh, and it's the third of, of this trilogy of another, another parable. It says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now you might think, what could be so significant about one verse of Scripture for you to dedicate a whole message to it here? But in this, this there is great significance in this parable. This passage, the Lord speaks with His disciples and with all those who were listening and with those of us who are reading the Word about what is going to be happening in our world under the banner of Christendom under the banner of Christian. Now, not everything that calls itself Christian is truly Christian. Uh, you know, he's, he's not here speaking about the kingdom of heaven, not just speaking about the true church or of heaven, but he's talking about all the people who profess to be Christians. Now, when I, I use that word loosely, Christians, and, and uh, you know, uh, the word, not everybody who professes to be a Christian is a Christian. You know, the, the Bible only uses the word Christian three times. He uh, uses it in the book of Acts twice, uh, Acts 11:26. It says they were called Christians first 
at Antioch. They were called Christians. I don't know if it was meant as an insult by their enemies. They were called little Christs. They were acting so much like Christ that they called them Christians. But not everybody who calls themselves Christian has earned the right to truly be called a Christian. A Christian is someone who is like Christ. Also, um, uh, Agrippa said in Acts, he said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And then Peter talks about it. He says, If, you, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So, talking about suffering as a Christian. But there's two, two ways that people interpret this parable. And we're going to look at the both. We're going to look at the wrong interpretation and the right interpretation. But Alan, we have some water for you on the back. On the back. All right, uh, so the wrong interpretation, people... Now, what, what I want you to do before I tell you that, I want you to underline three words in this parable. I want you to underline the word leaven, underline the word woman, and underline the word meal. And if we can understand with those three things, that's the key to understanding this parable. Now, chapter 13, the Lord had talked about the mustard seed. And the mustard seed tells us about corruption from without. Corruption from without. It talks about the outward influence of error upon the church. But this story of leaven talk, doesn't talk about corruption from without. It talks about contamination from within. An inward influence of error. You know, there's an outward influence of error, but there's also uh, from the world, from from, uh, from, from the worldly society. We try to impress them. We try to ma make ourselves look good and make ourselves look intellectual to them. So we try to make the church into something that, uh, that is, is less. It weakens it. It doesn't make it more powerful. But then, uh, then there's some, also the inward influence of error that comes into the church. And that's the idea of this parable, the idea of this leaven. Now, uh, the wrong interpretation, people say that uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. They say the kingdom of heaven is, is, uh, is the world, and leaven is the gospel. They say leaven is the gospel. Leaven is a good thing, and it goes into the world, and the woman is the church, and we, we, we hide the gospel secretly into the, into the world, and uh, the meal is, 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 they say the meal is, is the world. Uh, and so we, we're hiding the gospel, and the woman is the church. And so the, 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 they say the leaven is the gospel, the woman is, is the church, and the meal is the world. But actually, uh, I believe that that it goes against all the other references to leaven that you'll find in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. If you want to understand the Bible, you have to compare Scripture to Scripture. You have to try to find out what the Bible has to say about those uh, about that particular subject. And the, the, the doctrine of leaven is a huge doctrine in the Word of God. And uh, all, But every single time you find the word leaven, it's always, without exception, a negative thing. Ex and people say, well, yeah, that's true, except for here, and then they may try to make it a positive thing. But, uh, but that's but, uh, 17, in the, just in the New Testament alone, it's mentioned 17 times. And 16 of those times, there's no question that the leaven represents an evil influence. Uh, except for this one. This is the 17th time here in Matthew 13, 33, and people say it's left to interpretation. But uh, if you consider all the other uh, parables in the context of this verse, uh, then you, you realize that it represents something that's evil. And we're safe to say that leaven represents evil in verse 33. And so... The world is not going to get better and better. The people who interpret this parable the other way, they say, yes, the leaven, the leaven is the gospel, and we, we try to be secretive about it, we hide it, <laughs> and uh, until the whole world was filled with the gospel. That's what they say. But that would be discouraging if, that was the, the, if that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, wouldn't it? We'd get discouraged here. You know, We'd say, well, we're not doing a very good job of leavening the whole lump of... of, of our part of the world here in Peterborough, the whole the whole is not leavened, you know. Uh, in that sense, you know, it would be discouraging. But the Lord Jesus Christ didn't want to discourage us. He wanted to tell us what would be happening, what we would be facing, and he says that uh, the that the this meal is a is a beautiful thing. The meal, I believe, is the church. I believe that the woman is a reli a corrupt religious system, and I believe that leaven is their corruption, and that the meal is the church. Uh, the church is a beautiful thing. The church is made up of, of Christ Jesus, um, the wheat. We're going to get into all that. But notice the meal. It says, she hid it in three measures of meal. And so we talked about the leaven. Now let's talk about the meal. 
uh, in Genesis chapter um, thir- Genesis chapter 18, we see for the first time uh, a mention of three measures of meal. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. We see Abraham being visited uh, by three guests, and one of whom was the pre-incarnate Christ, we believe, because he received worship. And uh, Abraham refers to him as God, and so uh, later on. But uh, in that passage, it says in verse number 1, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Verse 2 says, And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Little, little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the heart. There we find for the first time in the Bible the mention of three measures of meal. So as the Lord was passing through, he announced to Abraham here the birth of his son, future birth of his son Isaac. Sarah, of course, laughed at that. And uh, then in chapter 19, the next chapter, we find the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, in chapter 18, we find for the first time the mention of three measures of meal. And in chapter 19, we find for the first time the mention of leaven. Leaven, the first mention. And it says that uh, when these three, when two of these angels went uh, into Sodom to try to get Lot to leave... It says that he tried to, he prepared something for them. In verse 3 it says, And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. That's the first mention of leaven in the Bible. Now, all through the Old Testament, though, God only would accept unleavened bread. Why? Because we're supposed to be separate from evil. God is totally separate from evil. He will not accept something until it's been totally separated from evil. And of course, what was he trying to do with Lot? He was trying to separate him from the evil of that evil city of Sodom. And he did finally separate him. But that's the the first mention here. And uh, it reminds us here of our fellowship with God. Our fellowship with God. Lot's fellowship with God had been infiltrated with evil. He had no more fellowship with God. His relationship with God had been leavened. You know, uh, and uh, here we see Abraham having a, a meal with these three guests. And he, you see the idea of fellowship there with God as well. And, uh, you know, our, our fellowship with God is very important. We'll get more into that in a minute. But the woman, she's also very significant in this parable. And uh, it says there, a woman took and hid. Now, all throughout the Bible you see a woman, in, in the symbology of the Bible, you see a woman representing a religious system, a religious system. Sometimes it represents a true, a true uh, rela- woman who has a true relationship with God. Like Israel was was uh, typified as a woman. Uh, sometimes they were acting like an adulterous woman, you know, in the book of Hosea, for example. But they they were they were like a woman that uh, God had nurtured up and and, uh, and and given them everything that they needed. And in the New Testament, you also see that the church is typified as a, a true woman, the bride of Christ. But everything that God does, the devil tries to counterfeit, doesn't he? And so the devil, uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 17, uh, if you turn there with me to Revelation chapter 17, we see that the devil tries to uh, I- uh, imitate this, and we see that this woman in, in Matthew 13, she's pictured here in Revelation 17, as an evil woman. And this is going to be the end of this evil religious system here in this world. uh, Revelation chapter 17 in verse 4, it says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, 
and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, uh, we saw on Wednesday night that uh, uh, there was going to be people being saved during the tribulation. People going to be saved, being brought out, uh, out of this, uh, the, the, this system that's going to come to, to its head during the, tribula tri during the tribulation. Now, even today, we see it happening. We see all churches saying, Doctrine's not important. Don't worry about doctrine. Just, just come together, uh, no matter what you believe, uh, under one, a one-world religion. And we talked about that in the Bible school as well. The ecumenical movement and all sorts of people trying to get... And the, and the ultimate result of that will be this, uh, will be this woman. Uh, elsewhere in the book of Revelation, it describes that at the head of this one-world religion will be someone called the false prophet. And he's going to be the Antichrist's uh, right-hand man. You know, the Antichrist will be bringing all the governments of the world together. And the false prophet will be bringing all the religions of the world together. And this is called the great harlot. And look at chapter 18, verse 2. It says, uh, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And so we see that the, these, uh, these unclean spirits, these birds that we learned about in the last parable, this great tree, this is the ultimate end of that great tree, and we, it still has these birds resting in it. And so this unclean religion, uh, it's, they're, they're even working today. They're even working today. They're trying to infiltrate the true gospel message with error. And Brother Rob said earlier in the, in the, in the uh, service that it can, so how quickly it can happen that uh, we, people can turn away from the truth. Churches can turn away if they turn away from the message of the Bible, the clear doctrine of the Bible. And, uh, you know, the Bible says that this woman, she did something, she took it. She took this, uh, this, uh, these, these meals, these three measures of meals, she took it all upon herself, she didn't do it by accident. She did it deliberately, and she hid leaven inside of these three measures of meal. You know, the Bible talks about how we, we're not supposed to do anything in secret. You know, Jesus said, uh, I've not done anything in secret. I've done everything openly. And uh, same with the church. You know, our church here, uh, we, there shouldn't be anybody uh, doing anything in secret. Sometimes maybe people... Sometimes you go to some preachers' meetings, and and, uh, and the preachers are uh, sometimes. Uh, now it's not true of the preachers' meetings so much that I've been to here in England, but but sometimes you see all the preachers whispering and gossiping to each other, and it gets kind of discouraging just to see that. You know, why are you whispering? Nothing in the church should be done in secret. It should all be open. And uh, you know that uh, you know that of course there's some things that that are are told to people in confidence on a on a counseling level, but as far as what the church is doing. What our church is doing, uh, nothing should be done in secret. We shouldn't be trying to infiltrate into places with the message of the gospel. Uh, we're supposed to we're supposed to do it openly. But this lady, she's doing these things in secret. She's being deceitful. The Bible says in the book of Jude, verse four, it says, "For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained of this con to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness." and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That word lasciviousness is going to come up again later in the sermon. But I want you to notice in verse 4 it says they crept in. You know that word crept means it was a secretive thing, a, a deceitful thing. And this, this parable that the Lord Jesus tells to his disciples, he says that there's a woman. She's going to typify our fellowship with God but then and our doctrine with God, but then this woman is going to add an evil element into the church. This uh, this this uh, religion, and so there's some people, uh, some churches. They also believe that the seven parables given in Matthew 13 correspond with the seven letters to the churches written in the Book of Revelation. And uh, this is uh, this is something that I've come across recently that um, that uh, some people would say that. 
the first parable in Matthew 13 corresponds with the first church, and the second parable corresponds with the second church. And so if we think that way, then this fourth parable corresponds with church number four, which is found in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. If you'll turn with me to, to that um, letter to the church which was written to Thyatira. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says, uh, And unto the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Each one of the churches had a different title given to the Lord Jesus. It says um, in verse 19, um, he says, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last... Uh, to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. There's that word seduce. It has the idea of trickery, doing something secret, of hiding something. Seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So the, the woman in this letter is, is named Jezebel. Of course, the historical Jezebel was the wicked queen of King Ahab in the book of 1 Kings. What did she do? She polluted the worship of God uh, and of God's people by introducing false uh, idolatry, false worship into their lives, the worship of Baal. And so God said, this woman who's in your church, I'm going to call her Jezebel because she, that she perfectly represents someone in the church or the church age who's polluting what's true. She was married to the king of Israel, and yet she was bring, bringing all these things in. And so the same thing with our day. You know, people who say that they're Christians, they say that they are part of the church, and yet they're bringing in these damnable things. They're bringing in these, they're sneaking these things in. And, uh, why, you know, why are we saying all these things? It's because not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. And uh, that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. We're supposed to be on guard. We're living in a day of, of, of deceit, of apostasy, of lots of lies. And so, uh, you know, some people say, well, a little, a little bit of leaven won't hurt anything, you know. And uh, that's what the people in Corinth were saying. They said, well, just a little bit of leaven, just one person coming in and doing this, they're not going to hurt, hurt anything. But, uh, but that's not true at all. Uh, you know, it, just one apple, one bad apple, can destroy the whole barrel, can it? You know, you've never, it's, nobody's ever taken a bad apple and put it into a barrel of good apples, and all the good apples turn the bad apple good. That's never happened. But it's many times where you take a bad apple and it, it corrupts the whole barrel. And that's what uh, uh, Paul tells the Corinthians. He says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And... Uh, the Bible, the Bible is very clear that, that this, is, this is the right interpretation of, of this parable. The earth's not getting better and better. You know, uh, I'm sure you know that. So I'm, I'm sure that you'll, uh, if, if you in, intelligently think about this parable with me, you realize that that's not the right interpretation. But 2 Peter 3.3 3 says that in the last days, scoffers would come. And uh, Matthew 24, Jesus said in the last days it will be like the days of Noah. It's going to get worse and worse. The end of our dispensation is going to be like the end of Noah's dispensation, Jesus was saying. It's going to get worse and worse until the flood comes and takes them all away. You know, we're, uh, 2 Timothy, it says, In the last days perilous times shall come. And uh, everybody's not all going to be saved. And so, But what, what can we do? We can sow as many seeds as we possibly can. We can, uh, we can do as much as we can. It's not by might, it's not by power, not by my might, not by my power, but it's through the power of God. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to do His work, you know. Uh, but sometimes we get in the way. We try to say, well, this, this isn't going to work. Let's add a little bit to this. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's try to make spin the gospel to where people will, will swallow a little bit easier, you know. But God's never going to bless 
something that's been corrupted. He's never going to bless a lie. We need to be truthful with people. He's, he's interested in the truth and that alone. And so we need to guard the gospel message. Adrian Rogers, he said, um, the gospel was not given to save civilization from the wreckage of mankind, but to save mankind from the wreckage of civilization. And so we're supposed to try to go in with the gospel, and we're not going to save all of civilization, but we're going to save man, people, individuals, from the wreckage of mankind. And, uh, and praise God for His grace in pulling people out, just like Lot was pulled out of Sodom before the judgment came. The gospel can pull people out of this world before the judgment comes. And so we need to keep the, the truth uh, from being weakened by pollution. Uh, the, um, uh, the Lord uh, leaves no doubt about what this leaven is. Now leaven in the Bible, as I said before, is always something bad. Uh, in, in the next time you see leaven, I told you the first time was in Genesis, the next time you see leaven in the Bible is in the book of Exodus. And uh, when the people were leaving, they were going to the Passover, uh, going to celebrate the Passover before they left Egypt. And when they celebrated the Passover, Jesus, uh, God said in Exodus 12, verse 15, He said, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And I counted in the book of Exodus and uh, in, the, in, the, in the law, I went through with my concordance, and in those first five books of the Bible, about 17 or 18 times he warns them not to try to offer God anything with leaven in it. 17 or 18 times. And so uh, the, 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 the children of Israel, they spent a, a whole day searching their houses for leaven. They would search their house for leaven. They would, they, would, they would go from the top of the house to the bottom to make sure there was no leaven in the whole house for the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you know, the same thing's true with us. God wants us to search from the top to the bottom of our hearts, to, to search our hearts to see if there's any leaven in our hearts to, to see if there's anything that would not be pleasing to God. And, and this leaven, this, this bread, this unleavened bread, it speaks again of our, our communion with God, our fellowship with God. You know, from, from the Passover meal, God was showing them there's a, there's a way to have a fellowship with God through the blood of the Lamb. And all the way until our uh, Lord's Supper, our communion meal that we have here at our church, uh, and, and, and New Testament churches all over the world. You know, it's a picture of our communion with God. And what do we use when we take the Lord's Supper? Unleavened bread. You know, there's no, there's no corruption. It's a picture of the body of Christ, which, which He had no sin. And so we're supposed to uh, search our, our hearts and search our lives for this leaven. They, they took the greatest care to free their houses from leaven, and they would search every corner with a lighted candle. That's what they were required to do. And that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. He says we're supposed to do that in our hearts. Let's look there together. 1 Corinthians. I told you this is a big subject in the Bible. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. May we do the same thing tonight. May we search our hearts from top to bottom with a, the candle of God's Word and the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. You know, he says, ye are unleavened. You know, as Christians, you are positionally unleavened. You've been forgiven of all your sin. You've been justified. That means just as if you were never a sinner at all. You have been made unleavened. But, uh, but he says, uh, try to live out practically what you already are in Christ's uh, position. Live up to what you really are. And Paul uses that argument a lot in the New Testament, doesn't he? Live up to what you really are in Christ. Live up to your full uh, potential of what the Holy Spirit wants you to be in Christ. Of what You're, you're going to be like this in heaven. You're going to be perfect and spotless in heaven. Just try to become more and more like you're going to be in heaven is what he's trying to say. Purge out the old lump. 
Purge out the old leaven that you may be a totally new lump, a new creature in Christ. That's what he's saying here. And then if you turn over to chapter... Uh, actually, let's, let's read... Uh, let's say here in chapter 5. Uh, but let, look at verse 8. It says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, ye not, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. And he goes on, he says, For then must ye uh, needs go out of the world. You know, just like Lot, the picture there again. Now, but now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. You know, so he's saying there uh, that leaven is, again, a picture of, of evil. He says in verse 8, he says, the leaven of malice and wickedness. Malice is something inside of your mind. Wickedness is something that you do in your action. So he said, in your own heart, you may have been infiltrated, you're supposed to be saved, you're unleavened, but the devil will try to sneak that leaven back into your heart. And the devil was trying to sneak that into this church. He was trying to sneak it into, and he was doing that with this one man. There was one man who was a fornicator in their church. He was a fornicator, and he was saying, your church is not going to be blessed because you have a fornicator in your church. Someone who is someone who's, uh, uh, having sexual relations outside of marriage, and you, you're allowing him to stay a member of your church. And so, this is a pretty serious thing. He said, this is a little leaven, he says, will leaven the whole lump. And so, he says, you have to purge the old leaven out. That's what he's trying to say to them. That's the teaching here. And uh, in, in, um, in Galatians, he says it as well. He says in Galatians, um, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7. Same reference as 1 Corinthians 5, 7, but Galatians 5, 7, he says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about one person that came into the church that was spoiling it. But in Galatians, he's talking about a whole group of people that came into the church. They were called the Judaizers. And he said, this persuasion comes not of him that calls you. So, he's saying here that this leaven represents an evil doctrine. An evil doctrine. It represents an evil, an evil doctrine, the doctrine of the Judaizers. He says, this little bit of leaven has leavened your whole church. And it's, it's going to just destroy all of you. You know, in Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 18, he said, Solomon says, one sinner destroyeth much good. That's a great verse, isn't it? One sinner destroyeth much good. So leaven is used of false doctrine. So what are we supposed to do? Well, the, the, the Lord tells us, we're, He warns us that we're supposed to try to avoid the false doctrine of this world. Remember that there were three different uh, measures of meal. And we're going to finish with these three measures of meal. And uh, hopefully... Hopefully uh, you'll have a, a complete understanding of the idea of leaven. But if you'll turn back to Matthew with me now. Matthew chapter 13, it says, A woman took and hid this leaven in three measures of meal. Now, what? There's three types of leaven that the Lord speaks about. I was going through the New Testament and looking, searching for this word leaven. And I found out that the Lord Jesus talked about leaven about three different groups of people. In, in the gospel records. The first of all is, the, is the, uh, the leaven of the Pharisees. So we're back in Matthew now, and uh, we were in Matthew 13, but let's look at chapter 16 of Matthew. Matthew 16, verse 6. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, so, He's saying to them, I want you to know the truth. I want you to, to beware, though, of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, now uh, the, the disciples, they didn't understand what he was saying. In verse 7, it says, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. 
uh, which when Jesus perceived, he said to them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? But in verse 12, it tells us what he was talking about. It says, remember we have to compare scripture with scripture. So what is the leaven of the Pharisees? Verse 12 tells us, it says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The doctrine of the Pharisees. So that's what the leaven of the Pharisees is. Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. The gospel is a powerful thing, but it has to stay pure. But there's some people out there, they try to corrupt the true doctrine of God's gospel, the true doctrine of God's word, with the leaven of the Pharisees, which we'll call, we'll call it legalism. Okay, well, the, 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 the leaven of the Pharisees is legalism. And he says legalism it can penetrate into your lump, into your church. Remember, the church is the loaf, it's the meal. You know, uh, Jesus Christ was the, the, the wheat, the bread from heaven. He was the true bread from heaven. He sows the good seed, and the true Christians are the wheat. They grow up, and, uh, and of course, through trials, through hardships, you take, you take uh, all different types of wheat, you put it in the fire, and it comes out as bread. And that's a church, you know. We're, we're all bits of wheat that have heard the gospel, aren't we? And we've grown up, and, and we've gone through lots of hardships, you know. And, and all different types of grain, you put it together, and you get bread. You know, there's all different types of people in our church. You, all different nationalities, all different backgrounds, all different uh, stations of life, all different pasts. And yet God brings us all together into one local church. And that is what the bread is. But then he says, uh, when this church is, is found, I want you to be aware of something. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Because legalism came into the early church very quickly. And uh, the Judaizers were legalists. What did the Pharisees believe? They believed in an outward religion. You know, um, They said, I want you to do a big list of things to try to, to, try to uh, keep away from sin. You know, Brother Rob preached a great message last Sunday morning about... Killing the giant within us, the giant of secret sin in your heart, you know. But a, a Pharisee would say, uh, "Don't worry about trying to kill the giant. Just try to put him in a cage, and uh, and try to put make a bunch of rules and regulations, and uh, and then you'll be fine." But really, they never really did anything. Jesus said, "You're just like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones." They never took the care of the real problem on the inside. But of course, Jesus Christ, he comes and he kills the giant of sin for us. And he helps us to defeat it uh, in our practical life as well. And so uh, the, the, the Pharisees, they, they uh, what was the, what, what were the, uh, another verse tells us a little bit more about the doctrine of the Pharisees. And it is in the book of Luke. Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Another example of, of, uh, Finding out what the, comparing scripture with scripture, finding out what the leaven of the Pharisees is. Luke 12, verse 1, it says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. He says, beware. Uh, these, these Pharisees, they're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. They say that they're religious people, but they're hypocrites. They say that they've got it all together, that, they, that they're right with God, but they don't. They're hypocrites. They've not gotten right with God, and yet they still say that they represent God. And so he says, beware of that. You know, there's so many people out there, they, they try to make Christianity look good to the world, without really talking about the, the power of the gospel to change people from the inside out. They try to make us look like we're helping people in other ways. But they're actually weakening, uh, they're weakening the, the gospel. There's people out there, they say, yes, we're Christians, but, but uh, you know, we believe in more of a social gospel, you know, trying to do things from the outside in, and they, they mix error with truth. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, lump, just a little bit. If we allowed somebody to come in here and uh, be a missionary from our church who, who maybe they don't believe the Bible. Well, we might say, well, what's the harm in just one missionary who doesn't believe the Bible? That's okay. At least we're, we're, we're doing something good. We're helping somebody. We're, we're doing this, that, or the other. And they try to justify it, but we're never supposed to mix truth and error. 
We have to stay true to the fundamental doctrines of the Bible. You know, and he says this is very dangerous, you know. He, Jesus doesn't say, beware the atheists, you know. Because we all know what the atheist believes. You know, everybody knows what the atheist believes. He says it outright. But the, he says, beware of the Pharisee. Because he's a hypocrite. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Uh, and so he, they're pretending to be some... They're, they're winsome. They're charming, maybe. But they're being used by the devil to leaven the church. And so we need to know what we believe. And uh, we need to... Um, we need to refuse to fellowship with Christians in a church setting who don't believe the Bible. And, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to uh, know what we believe. We're not supposed to be harsh or rude, but we just need to know what we believe and take a strong stand for the truth. You don't have to be harsh to people, but you can be pure and true in what you believe. And that's powerful, isn't it? Somebody who has strong convictions, it's a powerful thing. And then the second thing in chapter 16 of Matthew chapter, uh, verse 6 of Matthew chapter 16, he says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Who were the Sadducees? Well, the Sadducees were another group of people. And uh, they didn't believe some clear teaching in the Bible, like that, for example, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They said, We can't see it, we don't believe it. And you know, that's, uh, we're going to call, we called the, the Pharisees, um, we called them, uh, what did we call them? Uh, legalism, you know, legalism. You have to add a bunch of works to salvation. But what did we call, what are we calling the Pharisees? We're calling them liberals. There's so many people, they, they're liberals concerning the truth of the Bible. They say, I don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. So many churches have been pumped. They, they, they've had the leaven of the Sadducees pumped into them. They've had people who say uh, the, the miracles didn't really happen. Uh, you know, the resurrection, you know, of Jesus Christ never really happened. Archbishops and bishops, uh, the, the, the Bishop of Durham, you know, Mr. Pavitt was saying on Facebook that he, he said that the resurrection was just a, 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 a bit of trickery by the disciples. There's people like that today, just like they said. They were religious liberals. And uh, you can read about them in chapter 22 of Matthew. They said... They were trying to trick Jesus. They said, well, what if uh, a man dies and he doesn't have any children and his brother marries his wife and, and raises up seed and, and then uh, he dies and then another brother and seven brothers get married to the same lady. It, they said, uh, if you believe in the resurrection, which, which wife will he be married to in the resurrection? And of course the Lord Jesus said, you don't even believe in the resurrection. And he says, You're, you, we need to beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. They didn't believe and, uh, in the Bible. You know, so many people out there, they say, we don't want to hear the doctrine stuff of the Bible. We don't want to hear all that teaching of the Bible. There's so many people like that, aren't there? They say, uh, we don't, we don't want to hear all about what we believe about uh, uh, Christ Jesus being God. We don't want to hear about that. We want to know about what can help us day to day. But you know what? The Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. 2 Timothy 3.16 So we need doctrine. The Sadducees, they would say, just forget about all that doctrinal differences and doctrinal stuff. But Jesus says, beware of that. Stand up for the doctrine. And then finally, uh, tonight, over in Mark chapter 8, Jesus talks about another type of leaven. A third type of leaven that can sneak into the church. Mark chapter 8 and verse 15. It says there, And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So there's a third type of leaven that's going to try to come into the church. It's the leaven of Herod. In, uh, in Matthew 22, again, there was another group of people called the Herodians, and they came to Jesus with questions uh, about uh, money and about world, uh, about Caesar. You know, who was Herod? Herod was Herod was uh, a man who took his wife, the wife of his own brother, and uh, he 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 married her. And John the Baptist preached against that sin, and so John the Baptist was beheaded over it. So. So uh, that word licentiousness, that, we, that word lasciviousness, 
that we saw earlier. That's the type of, that's what the word that we're going to give to the leaven of Herod. It's not so much liberalism, but it's le uh, lasciviousness. You know, they, 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 what, they only care about the things of this world. They only care about power politically and pleasure and personally. And so that's what Herod was like. He just wanted power and pleasure. And there's people like that in the church as well, aren't there? They come in. They don't, they don't want to know anything about moral standards. They don't want to know anything about purity. They don't want to, anybody to tell them you have to take care of sin in your church. They want to just get more power and more pleasure. And Jesus says, beware of that leaven as well. This woman, she, she's hiding this leaven in the church. It's a devilish act. It's a, it's a bad thing. And uh, we need to remember that, uh, that we are the bride of Christ. And we need to be pure before the Lord. We need to examine our hearts and make sure that there's no leaven in our lives and no leaven in our church. And, uh, you know, we need to think about the world that we're living in. It's always trying to inject this, these things into our lives. It's all around us. But we're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be uh, unleavened bread. And what about our children? They're going to grow up in a, in a world that's even more, uh, putting even more pressure on them to try to uh, allow all these things into, into the church and into their lives. But we need to take a stand, don't we? If we don't take a stand, if we let a little bit in, it could open up the floodgates for future generations and the church could, could be destroyed. And so that's what happened to Thyatira. That's what happened that it doesn't exist anymore. That's what happened, uh, in, 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 that's what's happening all in our world today. And so we need to ask the Lord to help us to search our hearts. To, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's coming back. He's the sower. He sowed the good seed. He's going he's gonna to come back. He's going to call up all. He's going to gather all the wheat together into His barn. And we need to be... Uh, we need to be a pure loaf, so to speak, for when he comes back. Be ready to meet him when he comes back and not ashamed at his coming. Hopefully that wasn't too much uh, too much information all at once, but it's a big subject, the subject of leaven. And uh, I pray that, that uh, the Lord's helped us all to understand uh, this parable and the times that we're living in. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ who gives such great insight to, to what we're going to face. Father, we have everything we need. We're so equipped with the Word of God to be able to do our job here in this world. Father, we pray that we can be obedient to you. Help us to be humble, not to try to, uh, not to, try to um, look to water down the, the message, but help us to try to stay pure to the message of the Word of God. Help us not to weaken it, but help, us to, to, it, help it to be strong in its pure form. Father, I pray that you'll help our church to, to be uh, uh, spreading that, that good gospel message and may nothing ever hinder it or water it down. Father, we pray that you'll help us uh, not to allow any, any uh, person to sneak in or any secret, uh, secret deception to go on in our church, but Father, help us to be vigilant. And Father, we pray that you'll give us each uh, a desire to want to be personally uh, clean as well. Father, we pray in these things in Jesus' name, who, who loved us, who died for us, so that he could buy us and we could become part of your bride. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Page 166, we're singing, Search me, O God, and know my heart. <laughs>